Hello, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be answering some questions um, that a lot of the UPike family members have. Um, to submit questions, um, what you can do is at the very bottom, there is a thing in the middle of the screen that says chat. If you click on that, you're able to type questions, okay? If you want, you can type them directly to the panelists or all panelists and attendees. Uh, the all panelists, we will only see them, um, but if you do the ad attendees, the other members in the crowd will see them also. So feel free to submit any questions and we'll try to get them all answered. Thank you. So Dr. Webb, would you like to kick this off? You're muted. Got it. Sure. Happy to get going. <laughs> uh, this is Burton Webb. I'm the president of the University of Pikeville. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. I, I just was about to share my screen and I noticed that uh, it, it is unshareable. Larry, can you fix that for me, please? I'll give that just a second. Um, we're at, at this point, you know, uh, we are planning on remaining open for face to face classes. Uh, this fall, we are operating under a model that we're calling high flex or a hyperflex model uh, that is probably the most flexible kind of education that you can imagine. Um, our classes will be offered face to face, many of them, and then we'll have some that are offered online. Uh, we'll have the ability to transition back and forth between those two formats should the need arise. So I know that today, Governor Bashir uh, said that K through 12 schools need to remain online in non-traditional instruction uh, through, I don't remember the date, September 24th, I think, 28th. is that so? 28th? Okay. Um, but that doesn't affect higher education, at least not yet. Uh, there was a specific question asked about that, and his response was, higher education has a different set of needs. Uh, we don't have kids going home to their parents and their grandparents every day, which is generally true. Uh, certainly residential colleges like the University of Pikeville don't have that. So what we've been working on really uh, since this started back in March and we began to understand COVID-19 and uh, the virus that causes that disease is a plan to reopen that would allow us to um, be able to do several things. First of all, we want to bring students back in a way uh, that we know that they're as safe as they can be. Uh, and that's why we're asking all students who are living on campus to be tested, just to make sure that they're negative for, for COVID when they arrive. Uh, if they do convert to a positive status during the course of the semester, uh, our plan is to get them tested, uh, to isolate them from the other students, and then to go through the process of contact tracing and quarantine any students who have been close contacts of theirs, uh, according to public health department policy. Uh, we've reserved spaces on our campus. There's a whole residence hall that's been set aside for isolation and quarantine uh, so that those students don't come into contact with the students and the rest of the population. Um, if my screen share is ready, I'll show you what that plan looks like. Give me just a second here. Uh, I, I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, well, hang on. I've got a different computer here, so I've got to go to my system preferences and see if I can get that done. You know what? I'm not going to be able to. Uh, here we go. Maybe I am. Uh, well, it's going to log me off in order to get that done. So I'm just going to talk my way through it. Uh, so basically, our, our system was set up um, to model the, the same system that they're using in New Zealand right now. If you followed the news, you know that New Zealand is a, a small country that has a population of about 8 million, and they have been able to um, really control the infections that are coming into the country. It's not completely isolated in that they don't have people coming in. They do, but when they come into the country, they're tested. If they're positive, they're immediately isolated and quarantined, and so they've been able to keep their infection rate at an incredibly low rate. I haven't looked in the last couple of weeks, but it, the the last data I saw was under 20 or 30 cases over the last month or so. Maybe, maybe Dr. Meyer has looked since then, but I haven't. Uh, it's just been very low. They've been very, very, he says, okay. They've been very effective uh, at, at controlling the infection. It's not that they don't have it, it's that they've been effective at controlling it. So we built our system based on theirs. It's got four levels. Level one 
is uh, what I call pre-COVID. So we would be operating in the same way that we were operating prior to the, to the pandemic beginning uh, in, in January here in the United States. So I don't see us being at level one probably at all this year. Oh, here we go. Larry, you're just amazing. Gosh, you gotta love Larry. Uh, so, so this is what our, our level plan looks like. Um, and level one is in green. You can see that that would be, you know, if, if we hadn't ever gotten it here. And our goals in level one would be to keep COVID away from our campus uh, at all costs. But we do have some community-based spread, so we're not at level one. Level two and level three are similar in a lot of ways, uh, except that there are some additional restrictions of movement in level three that you don't see in level two. Uh, level two is when there is a mild or a moderate community-based spread of COVID-19. And we do have that in Pike County. Uh, I think currently there are somewhere on the order of about 40 uh, active cases in the whole of Pike County. Uh, that's about 65,000 people who live here and only about 40 cases uh, in, in the county. So it, it's a pretty low um, rate of infection, of active infection, a pretty low rate of new positives uh, if you compare it to, you know, especially states like Florida or California where they've got a very high rate. Uh, level three is substantial community-based spread. We've decided not to put numbers on those. Instead, we're going to listen to our local health department because they track it far more closely than we do, and they're still recommending level two for us. Level four, uh, comes in really two flavors. Uh, level four would occur when there is a positive test on our campus. Uh, level four, the way we're using it most of the time is a very specific kind of thing. So for example, if we had a case of COVID that popped up in, um, in, Cole, in Cole Hall, which is our medical school building, and there was a person in Cole who became positive, what would we do? Well, we'd isolate Cole, we tell all of those students to go online immediately until we could go in and do deep cleaning. We'd listen to contact tracing. And if they told us you got 10 students who need to be quarantined, they'd be quarantined. The person who was infected would be put into isolation and then we would clean coal and then coal would reopen as quickly as possible. That's what we're calling the, the sort of surgical view of level four. Now, if we had a circumstance where we had a person who tested positive and they had wandered all over campus and interacted with all kinds of people, then we would push the whole of campus online until we could get contract, contact tracing done. And, and then we would quarantine and isolate and do those same things. So there, there's sort of the surgical approach to level four where we're working really, really carefully to get a, a small case uh, isolated and quarantined fast. And then there's the more broad case. We haven't had any broad cases of level four yet. Uh, we actually have had a few, uh, what I would call surgical approaches to level four where we had uh, a couple of students who tested positive in our medical school. And then we've also had uh, a couple of football players who arrived on campus with a positive test. And we, we had to quarantine some students as a result of that. Uh, so we've had a couple of circumstances of level four, but so far, uh, nothing campus wide. Uh, we'll post this. Stephanie, uh, I'm, I see you on my screen. So you'll take care of posting this so everybody can see it, if, or at least put the link up where they can get access to it. Uh, so they can go through the whole thing. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I don't think that it, it's completely necessary. But the answers that I provide to questions that you might ask will mostly come from this document. So if I say something, you'll be able to come back to the document. All right. So those up, oh, Larry's got it right here on our webpage, Healthy at UPike. And if you scroll down just a little bit, uh, you can see that he's got the level system there and you can download the full set of guidelines right there if you want to do that. So Larry, uh, with that, I think you can stop sharing the screen and uh, we'll go to questions. So Justin. Okay, the first question is, what is the plan for when a student in the residence hall has COVID? What will happen to the student and what are the steps to take with any students that have come in contact with them? So this is really the heart of the questions. I think most of the questions that people will ask tonight this is at the heart of it. So um, when students come to campus, if they're a residential student, they live on campus, we're asking them all to be tested. So they have to come with a test result that's less than five days old or be tested when they arrive to campus. Um, and we're doing that with intention. We wanna make sure that we have a baseline uh, that is a healthy baseline when we start. 
all students seven days before coming, in fact, all employees as well, uh, will have to do a screening every day. They need, to, they need to come with a thermometer. Let me make sure that that's clear. Students need to come with a thermometer. It doesn't have to be a fancy digital thermometer. It can be an old fashioned kind, you know, that you just stick in your mouth and wait until it's, it's done. Uh, or it can be digital or it can be fancy. It doesn't matter, but they need to come with one. Once a day, we're asking all students to take their temperature and to respond to nine health questions that are all related to COVID-19 symptoms. Those same questions are the ones that are used by almost all healthcare providers in the country now. Uh, if you go to the hospital, if you're an employee, you have to take your temperature every day and you have to answer these questions. So we're asking all students to do that beginning seven days before they arrive and then continuing the whole time that they're here on campus. So that's a health screening. Uh, we're asking students to come with a, a negative COVID test. If they have a positive test, then they're gonna be isolated at home before they come. If they come and they have a positive test when they arrive, we have a few students who don't have access to testing because it's either too expensive or not available in their area, uh, we'll take them to get tested. And if they test positive, they'll go directly into isolation. Uh, they will not enter student life or their dorm room. We have some isolation rooms and we're placing all of those students in isolation. We'll provide food for them. We'll take care of them. We do, I believe twice a day health checks. Is that right, Justin? Yep, Justin's the one in charge of that. So twice a day health checks, they, they get the things that they need. Uh, and, and the health department actually locally calls them every day as well, just to make sure that they're okay. So they get health checks from us, they get health checks from the health department uh, and, and we'll make sure that they're, they're doing well. Um, if something develops and they get serious, we'll take them to the hospital if we need to. Uh, we hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, uh, then that's what'll take place. They will be pulled away from their regular dorm. They won't stay in their regular dorm room uh, if they test positive for COVID. Uh, then the health department will, will reach out to them and they'll do an extensive interview uh, over, this, over the phone and they'll ask them about all of the people with whom they have had close contact in the last 48 hours. Close contact is very well defined according to the health department. Someone with whom you have spent more than 15 minutes at a proximity of closer than six feet without a mask. So we're telling all students stay more than six feet away, always wear a mask. If all students were able to comply with that, we would have no close contacts on our campus. Now, you can't always do that. And it's not actually you know, healthy to always do that. We need to have some people with whom we can interact without that barrier in front of our faces, which is why we've created family groups inside the residence halls. Family groups are very small, just a, a few students. Uh, I believe it's up to 10 or so students in a family group. Generally, they live on the same wing or the same set of rooms. And with those students, they're able to interact without PPE. Now, if your student is nervous about that and they wanna wear their mask all the time, they're, they're fine doing that. Uh, they, can, they can be a part of a, a family group, but not interact without their mask, it's fine. If they wanna keep distance all the time, they can keep distance all the time. But we've created these family groups because they're not unlike your family at home. You know, it is a group of people with whom you can go home, you can take your mask off, and you can just be a real person. Uh, so if anybody comes up uh, as a close contact, according to the health department, the health department will issue a 14-day quarantine mandate. We will move them into our quarantine facilities. And just like the people who are isolated, we'll provide them with food and health checks and all of those things. Uh, they'll be able to take their classes online. They'll be able to, to continue to learn and do the things that they need to do while they're in quarantine. And uh, then we'll send them for testing at the end of quarantine because we don't want them to move back in if they've turned COVID positive. Uh, but once they pass quarantine, have a negative test, they can go back into the residence hall and continue as they were. Uh, this is the approach that was used by New Zealand really to great effect. You find people who are infected, you isolate them, quarantine their close contacts and keep the rest of campus uh, safe. A related question to this has come in through the chat. Will or can the school prevent or limit where students go off campus to help prevent from bringing the virus to campus? I would absolutely love it if we could lock every student down on campus, but I don't think that's realistic. Uh, we have a, a sister school over in, in uh, Berea 
that has a fence all the way around their campus and they are confiscating all car keys. And students have to get permission to walk across the street. Now, we don't have the ability to do that. So we're not planning on doing that. We're asking students to be responsible and we're asking students to maintain their mask wearing and maintain personal distance. And that's at this point, the best that we can do. We, we don't want to lock students down. Okay, next question. My daughter will be attending this fall. She will be a first year student. She is severely allergic to canola oil. Uh, who should I contact regarding this related uh, to food allergies with the university? Well, I don't have to answer everything. And I think that one's one that uh, Justin or, or Tace can answer. Yep. <laughs> I would suggest the student, number one, if they're living on campus, make sure they indicate that information in their housing application. We do have those allergies because if we do co come across a student late at night, we do look at those documents to say, is there an allergy? Is there something causing this reaction? Secondly, I would suggest if not contacting my office, at least contacting the cafeteria so we can sit down and have a conversation with Marie over in the cafeteria to make sure that they have this information and they can prepare uh, a workaround regarding the cafeteria food. So those would be the two major areas that I would suggest contacting. Uh, next question, keeping the students safe in the residence halls question. Uh, they are very tight quarters. How are we going to go about doing that? I think I've just described that really, you know, with the family units and someone just pointed out to me that we haven't introduced the panelists and, and that's probably on me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists uh, to, to identify themselves and tell what you do on campus and sorry, you're going to go in the order that I have it on my screen. So Brandy, that means you're first. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, my name is Brandy Gullahue. I'm the Associate Vice President of Finance and Business Affairs and Controller. So from a student perspective, it will be um, I manage the business office, which is your student account, making payments, getting a refund, work study checks. Um, but then also your students probably going to be receiving emails from my office for Bear Paws, which is our clearance event. And that's just kind of a, a list of the things that you need to do before you're ready to be a student in the classroom. And we line those up with move-in days. So it's just kind of a, you know, here's your financial aid requirements, housing requirements, just the things that we need from you before it's time to move in. And second on my screen is Stephanie. Uh, I'm Stephanie Stiltner. I'm the Director of Family Connections, with, which resides within the Division of Student Success. But I'm also um, co-chair of the GROW Committee. So I've met a lot of students and families that way through the orientation process. Um, basically, I help families help students. So. We support them on campus and then I help you support them off campus. So together we got parallel systems and it's all about student success. Sounds good. Kelly, you're up next. Um, Kelly Wells, Director of Athletics here at U Pike. And uh, again, I'm doing the same thing with Family Connections, just focusing in on athletics as well. We're, we're a great partnership and uh, all of us work together to, to meet the needs of the students. Uh, Dr. Meyer. My name is Matthias Meyer. I'm the Dean of Student Success. So the traditional kind of student support services academic wise. So um, we do the uh, kind of ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. We uh, do student success broadly, registration, um, academic assistance, uh, tutoring, uh, supplemental instruction, family connections, and then also the first year seminar and the new student orientation. Dr. Owens has already introduced himself. He's the Dean of Students. And anything else you do, Justin, that you want to tell him about? Pretty much if it has to do with your life outside of the classroom that is non-academically related, it's probably in my bubble. So housing, security, counseling, you name it. Anything that is a support service, that's, that's my genre. And then last but certainly not least is Dr. Lori Worth. Lori? Hi everybody, my name is Lori Worth and I am the Provost and Chief Academic Officer. I oversee all of the academic programs at the university, our undergraduate, our graduate, and our two doctoral programs. Anything that is student related, whether it's curricular or co-curricular, um, very happy we've got a great group of leaders here today. Thanks to Stephanie, what she does with Parent Connections and great to meet all of you.
All right, I think that hit everybody. At least that's all of them on my screen. Um, so just one more comment about how we're gonna keep kids safe on campus. I, I think we need to be very clear about something. Uh, there is no safe space from COVID. Let's just be clear about that. COVID-19 is a virus that can get just, just anywhere really in the United States. We cannot keep your child perfectly safe. We can keep them as safe as possible. And that's what we're gonna work to do. Uh, you know, they could come, they could come up positive just walking through Walmart or McDonald's or, or wherever and that might have absolutely nothing to do with the college campus. Um, and, and that's, that's a very real thing. What we will do is we will test frequently. We'll make sure that we can isolate and quarantine the people who are, who are ill so that we can prevent the virus from having a, a large outbreak on campus. That's our goal. We're going to work hard to try to make sure that that takes place but there is no absolute safety from this virus until we get a vaccine and drug therapies and all sorts of things. Okay, next question. How will UPike provide meals to students since cafeteria style meals do not seem possible? Okay, that's me. Um, we will be providing uh, food actually in the cafeteria. We have worked diligently to set up not only a to-go box, option for students that don't feel comfortable being in the cafeteria, um, but also some areas within the CAF that are spaced out that students within their family units can sit together, uh, eat together without their masks on because they're already um, in generally uh, within the community interacting with each other with masks off at other times. So there are no greater risk being in the CAF sitting in that little area sitting together. On top of that, we are working with an outside company to bring in some tents to our plaza, which will provide some outdoor seating as the semester goes on. So that will be coming probably within that first week of class. So between all three options, we will have a variety of ways for students to be able to get fed, make sure that they're feeling safe. And worst case scenario, if they do get to go, they can always go back to the room where they feel safe within their family unit. Okay, next question. I understand that the students will be living in family groups. How will that work? Will these family groups consist of their sports team members if they're involved in sports? Uh, this was partially addressed earlier. Sports teams are taken into consideration, but also their residential living uh, community. So let's say if they're living in Wickham, they have one roommate, whereas if they live up in Page, they might have up to six or eight. So depending on those units, on what they're, who they're living with, and how they're sharing bathrooms determines how we set family units. Uh, next question, for commuter students, how will this all be regulated? I have lived on campus for three years and I am commuting from my hometown for my last year. I was just wondering if we will be asked to have multiple tests or just one and monitoring. So for commuter students, especially those who live in Eastern Kentucky, um, we are going to be monitoring, we'll do your screening process every day. But when you come to campus, just like all the rest of the students, you need to mask up and you need to wear your mask properly, all right? I, I know we've all seen this and I brought my mask just so we could do it. This is a proper mask. It needs to fit snugly over your nose and mouth so that there's no air that comes out. If I see you like this on campus, I'm gonna call you out. That's not wearing your mask properly, okay? If your nose is out of the mask, you're still breathing through your nose, you're spreading virus and you're getting infected. If you show up on campus with a chin cozy, no. This is not wearing a mask, okay? That, that's having something dangle from your face. And I see this a lot too, and I always comment whenever I see this, hey, cute earring, I really like that, but that's not a mask. So just make sure that your students have multiple masks. They need to wear them all the time. And this is especially commuter students because commuter students are gonna go back and forth in the community. Um, and so wear your mask, more than six, six feet distance, keep your distance and you should be okay. That's remember, you're not a close contact if you wear your mask more than six feet distant. So just be sure that you do that and you should be okay. Wash your hands. Don't come if you're sick. I could say all these things a bunch of times, but I think we've all heard them before. Um, and then, you know, we may do some random testing throughout the semester. We're still working on some partners for that. Uh, and if we do that, then that'll help us even identify more what's going on. 
We have a question that came in that is probably best answered by Brandy. How do first year students get their IDs on the 19th? Is there a specific time for freshmen to move in? Okay, so if you are a freshman who is going to be moving in prior to that, then you would have a move-in date that's probably already happened or will happen Friday and you get it at that move-in date. If you are either playing a sport, being residential or a commuter student on the day of the 19th for new student orientation, you'll pick up your ID card there. Um, probably by Thursday or so of this week, we will try to get the time of your move-in on that day to you. I'm trying to work with you know, coaches and group leaders and try to get everybody's time to make sense for them. Um, so we'll send you kind of a, a Bear Paws email that says, here's the things that you still need to do and here's the time that you come in. Um, and then I won't go into it here, but I, there's instructions on, you know, where you start for your move in, where you end up, just what we, you know, who to look for, who's going to wave at you. Um, so basically just check your UPOC email and we'll give you your time. If you are a freshman and you have not done the uh, Canvas Grail course assignment to upload your photo. You can do that now, anytime between now and probably next, whatever the 17th is. Um, but if you don't like any pictures, you're having trouble uploading it, we will take it the day of when you get here. Thank you. Uh, the next question actually came in twice. Um, how are classrooms going to be set up and can students uh, take their classes completely online? Sounds like I, a great question for Dr. Worth. Yeah, Justin, I'm happy to take that one. So I started typing the answer that all classrooms on our campus, um, regardless of the academic building, have been measured. And there is a sign that talks about the capacity for each classroom. We've also made the decision that although we're keeping six feet apart, we are also asking students and our faculty to wear masks. So this is important. The distance plus the mask are not required. The university is actually going above and beyond because we feel both are very important. Some students may have underlining health challenges. Some faculty or staff may on campus. Some folks are just choosing not to disclose. And so to really just care about our community and to know that, that we are a family here on campus, we just feel like doing both is very, very important. Depending on classes and online, there are universities and some choosing to move entirely online from the first day of class. And really as a university, we've chosen not to do that. Um, it is very important for students to be able to establish relationships with their professors, their coaches, advisors, tutoring staff, academic support staff on campus, individuals from the library, the business office. And so as a university, what we've set is the ability for our classrooms to be spaced in a safe way. The cleaning staff who are here and we've designated ways for them to be um, diligent about cleaning, especially high traffic areas, uh, the dining hall and taking steps into providing safety with meals versus having the university moving all online. Okay, the next question I'm seeing a lot of questions about are uh, from uh, regarding athletics and this fall. Coach Wells, could you uh, give us a good understanding of what the fall will look like? and also what we're doing with fans in the stands. Sure. Awesome, thank you, Just appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity. You know, we just had a, a release today uh, that just kind of mentioned a little bit about Mid-South Conference and to kind of clear it up so everybody's kind of on the same picture. It's broken down into three pieces. So the NAI has legislation over when national championships are. The Mid-South Conference will have uh, autonomy on deciding when conference schedules are played. And then institutions have uh, the availability to make decisions upon what non-conference schedules look like. So the NAI has released that all ch national championships will be performed in the spring for all sports. Mid-South Conference has made the exact same announcement. All Mid-South Conference competitions will be in that same spring semester. Now the autonomy is on the schools, what we wanna do with non-conference. And we just got this uh, today, so we will work on what that's going to look like for each sport. So obviously it's not a one-size-fits-all, as you can imagine, that golf does not look the same as far as 
uh, contact uh, as, as football or even a basketball. So each sport will be looked at individually to kind of see what that plane is going to look like. We set a date for the September 25th, 26th weekend as the initial opportunity to start with contest. So if a non-contact contact sport such as golf wanted to participate at that time, uh, that would be a decision our school could make in that. So we're looking forward to having seasons, what they look like. You and I both know that it changes every day. Uh, if you're keeping track of the news, it's very uh, up and down and what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. So that's currently where we stand in terms of what our, our seasons of competition are going to look like. Uh, that was question number one. Hit me on that question number two, Justin. What are the, what are the fans in the stands going to look like? That's yeah, that. currently they're, they're you know that's all done by our, our local governments and health officials. And you've seen some um, graduations that we've had. You've seen some different events that we've had in terms of what it looks like on an outside event versus an inside event. And we'll follow those guidelines completely. So uh, as we dig in the weeds of what each game and each competition is going to look like whether spectators will be able to sit six feet apart, you'll have a certain amount of folks that can attend games. Uh, that will be something we'll determine kind of as we set our schedules. And the number one trigger for that will be setting our national championships. So once they schedule national championships at the end of the year, we can all continue to work backwards. So that'll give us a little bit of time and space to set all those. So we'll get the national championships, we'll be able to set our conference schedules, and then we'll be able, as an institution, to look and see what fits us best as an athlete, coaches, uh, as far as the uh, the fall would look like. And to follow up, Kelly, to those questions are: What guarantee do parents have that their children will be safe playing sports? Uh, everybody just smiled right when that question came through. There, I appreciate all your support. Uh, you know, there's there's no guarantee. Obviously, that's a. I think that's a a strange ask in terms of what a guarantee looks like to stay safe. You're not guaranteed to stay safe if you sit in your living room and never leave. So, you know, obviously we're doing every step we possibly can. And you, you kind of saw the diligence that we put into figuring out what it looks like on campuses, what it looks like on our practice fields, what it looks like in our weight room, uh, what it's going to look like while we're providing masks for each student athlete, uh, what we're talking about with uh, signage, uh, directional signage on campus or family grouping. So it's been exhaustive in, in the terms of what we're planning but again, you know, again, we're, nobody's protected from this virus completely, certainly not myself and, and those that we're speaking to as well. So we'll do all we can to master that as best we can. But certainly if you're looking for a guarantee, that's, that's not something I can, I can provide. The next question would probably go to Dr. Worth or Dr. Webb. Um, are the students going to the bookstore to pick up their books? When will the students' schedules be able to Yeah, I'm happy to answer that one, Justin. So um, students do not need to go to the bookstore. We actually, um, with the help of our faculty members, really changed direction on textbook here at the university when we moved to block scheduling. Many of you have heard that our 16-week semesters are now turning into two eight-week uh, modules that, that will encompass the calendar for fall semester. We also asked our faculty to select textbooks that were going to be no cost to families. This was done for a variety of reasons and I could probably talk on an hour about how exciting this is, how it'll impact student learning, how it'll benefit many of our students who I know were not able to find employment this summer. Um, I tell you, I'm, I'm just super proud of our faculty. It's a tremendous amount of work to take a math class, for example, that was offered 16 weeks move it back to eight weeks and not only that, but the book that used to cost $180 now costs zero. Um, and, and that was done in large part. Dr. Meyer played a huge role in that. Um, Dr. Owens helped us out. Brandy in her office definitely was very supportive as we priced out the cost of textbooks. And quite frankly, it's an astronomical amount of money that has been put on the backs of families. And so we felt as a university that given the pandemic, the challenges for employment, um, that, that we wanted to do a complete turnaround. And so that's, that's really what we get to do now is when your students are in class, they will all have access to Canvas, which is the learning management system here for our campus. And students will have a link. All of their books will be provided. Several faculty had requested hard copy books the university paid for those. And so your students may get books in class that first day. 
but the majority of students will have a link to their textbook. Um, and, and honestly, that's, that's going to be a great thing that I think many universities will start moving to in the next couple of years. Okay, there was a question that came in. Are we going to be able to have work study jobs? I'm gonna actually answer that one. Work study jobs will be available just like they were in the past. Students will need to log into Bears at Work, which is on our website. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. I'll try to uh, make sure we get that link over to you. But there is the ability for you to sign up for all the jobs that are available there. Actually, we have more than we were expecting uh, for last spring before COVID. So more people signed up for jobs um, to have jobs available on campus. So that's, that's a great thing. So students, there are plenty of opportunities. Okay, um, question for Dean Meyer probably. When will student schedules be viewable? Well, most students' uh, schedules should be viewable already if they are registered. So we want to encourage them if they're moving through the growl process, if they're new students, that they need to uh, kind of finish that quiz and, and, and we'll take it from there. If it's returning students, uh, they should be, could be, and uh, maybe uh, just need to contact us ASAP and we'll get them there. They should be registered already. They can reach out to their, um, either their faculty advisor, if they can, can reach that advisor, or they are welcome to reach out to any of the advisors in the Center for Student Success and we'll have them registered in, uh, in short order. There's no problem with that. A similar question. My daughter is supposed to be doing an internship for her communications major. How will she be able to do this outside of the university? Um, I would probably have that first conversation, reach out to your faculty, have that conversation to see if, uh, if they do not feel comfortable being at that location, maybe rescheduling it somewhere else. A lot of the internships are set in locations that will be having similar practices that we have. Um, so it would be having a conversation with that site to say, is this a safe place for me as an individual? And then going from there. If it's not, we'll redirect and try to work with you and the faculty to move ahead. And there's also a variety of virtual internships that our faculty and departments are working on. So again, it just depends, as, as Dr. Owens mentioned, on where the student is being placed, the flexibility that we have. But honestly, there are many companies that are looking for virtual work as well. So they're in similar situations, jobs that are opening careers that honestly six months ago folks wouldn't have even thought could be remote. Now there are a lot of opportunities that I think our students can benefit from with practical job skills. Okay, another question that popped in is regarding testing. Can students be tested once they get there along with five days prior? So not just the initial, but afterwards. And um, uh, concern about students who receive a negative test and by the time they get to school, possibly becoming positive. Yeah, always a concern, uh, which is, is why we try to keep it within that five-day window. And then we ask students to limit their contacts in that five-day window. But sure, that's always a concern. Students can turn positive at any time. It, it's really just a baseline for us. That's why we're doing the health checks every day, starting seven days prior and continuing through the whole semester. But at any time that a student wants to go and get tested, right now in the, in the state of Kentucky, they can go and get tested. Uh, we have to be careful not to overwhelm our local health system, but at least for right now, where we sit right now, uh, we have three organizations that are willing to test. So uh, one of them is a traditional PCR antigen test, which takes a little longer, you know, 48 to 72 hours, they say on average, but I've seen it go longer than that. And then there are two rapid tests that we have available in the community as well. Uh, one of them is in short supply and needs to be scheduled. The other one we have a little more access to right now, but it, it could be overwhelmed if we're not careful. So we do have access to testing and we can get testing done. Okay. Next question is for Kelly Wells. My student athlete is nervous about playing their contact sport, but we can't afford to lose the athletic scholarship. Will other scholarships be made available to students? Great question. I appreciate whoever asked that. You know, scholarships athletically will not go away uh, just because we suspend or move sports to different sports season. So uh, certainly there will be other scholarships available if you want to apply for those as well. But the athletic scholarships will certainly uh, stay in place. So do not. We have no anticipation of that. 
happening anyway. Uh, next question is about cleaning. How will classrooms be cleaned and how often? How many students will be in each class? Well, I guess I'll jump in on that one. Uh, cleaning will happen multiple times throughout the day and in between every class, they'll get in and, and clean um, the high touch surfaces. We're providing uh, cleaning spray and paper towels in every classroom so that students can clean their own desks. Uh, they can clean them prior to, to sitting down at the desk or, and, and we really recommend at the end of the hour that they clean them again so that they're clean when the next class comes in. Uh, how many people per class depends on the size of the classroom. So we've got some classrooms in Armington that are fairly small. There are only six to eight people, but then we have one class in that building that normally seats uh, 250 maybe, and it's, it's rated now, I think it's 60 students. So we went in, we took a tape measure, Dr. Worth and I measured everywhere and to just make sure this seat, this seat, this seat, and those are the ones that we can use. So all across campus, uh, all of the classrooms have been uh, limited in their number of seats to keep kids at least six feet apart. Okay. If the university is at level four and all instruction is delivered online, does that mean residential students must vacate the residence halls? No, just the opposite, actually. We want them to stay in the residence halls, just lock down there uh, until we can get contact tracing done and quarantine and isolate those people who need to be quarantined and isolated. Uh, next question is similar. What if my student moves to campus but then decides that they would rather commute? Well, that's always a possibility, right? I, I think we have a process for students who want to do that, so I don't think that changes at all. I think the number one thing you'll have to do is communicate with us. Let us know, um, first off, that you've had a conversation with the faculty and student success to make sure that all opportunities are available online for your classes. And then on top of that, um, if you're wanting to just commute from home instead of being residential, just talk to the Office of Residence Life. They'll make sure that they work with you to progress on that. Let me point something out, Justin. Um, yes, commuting, commuting, commuting from home is not necessarily a safer option. In fact, what we're, what we're working to do when we test everybody and we bring them in and then make sure we've quarantined and isolated anybody who brings COVID into campus, we're working to equilibrate the campus with the community in terms of the amount of COVID. And that's actually a really good thing because Pike County has a very low rate right now. So if you compare us to a place like, like Jefferson County or Fayette County or even down near Bowling Green, you're gonna find that the, the Pikeville community is far safer than those. So living on campus will equilibrate very quickly with what's going on in the community. And we're actually doing several things that the community's not doing. So screening, testing, and actually isolating and quarantining people in a way that's real and meaningful is, is something the community's not doing. We're, we're asking people to wear masks, we're, we're watching them to make sure they stay physically distant, Again, things the community is not doing. So I would argue that we're safer than living out in the general community. Okay, next question I probably have to answer. Since cleaning and sanitizing is an important now more than ever, how will we ensure that the bathrooms are clean within the residence hall, especially with these young males, um, and cleaning their bathrooms to make sure that it's uh, clean enough and disinfected? Uh, basically, what we're doing for first-year housing, uh, most of our community bathrooms are only within first-year housing. That's um, over in Condit and Wickham Halls. So we will be having facilities, uh, housekeeping go through there, make sure that we're disinfecting daily and spraying it down regularly to just make sure that everything is clean. Uh, we regularly do that every year, but we will be doing that even more just to go through and do wipe downs and do that regularly throughout the day. Um, the other spaces, it's within your family unit. So we're having the conversation with the students about making sure that when they're using their bathrooms to wipe them down because they're only putting themselves at risk because it's being shared with either two people, four people, six, and in very few eight people. So that is the max that anybody would be doing and uh, using their bathrooms with those individuals. Um, those are the same people that they're not wearing masks with, that they're in their family units. So it would be more of a risk for us to be bringing people into there than uh, having uh, the individuals actually clean those bathrooms themselves. 
And Justin, I think we're also providing disinfecting spray and paper towels in all the bathrooms too, so that students can wipe things down before they touch things to make sure that they're safe. Yep. Okay, we only have a couple questions that came in beforehand. Um, is there a charge for COVID testing in Pikeville? Uh, it, it's a mixed answer. Some of, some of the testing uh, is still covered by the state, um, but that's not always the case. I think that right now, most health insurance companies are waiving the cost of tests or are waiving and, and waiving deductibles because they want people to get tested. So, uh, and then I, my understanding is right now, all three of the testing organizations in Pikeville are submitting uninsured folks for reimbursement to uh, HHS or one of the other agencies and getting their reimbursement that way. Uh, that might change, but that's not the way it is right now. Okay, you answered another question. So that, that made it a little bit easier. <laughs> Do non-residential and non-student athlete individuals need to be tested? Right now, we're saying that if you're living at home uh, and commuting back and forth, you, you are likely to have the same infection rate as the community, which remember was our goal. Uh, but if you walk onto our campus and you're going to take classes, you need to mask up. So you need to wear a mask. You need to make sure that you keep that on all the time. If you plan to come and live on our campus, you need to be tested uh, because we've got that microcosm of community that's taking place in the residence halls. So we've got a lot of students who are local who are saying, well, why should I be tested if the commuter doesn't? It's because you're living here and living on our campus. We want you to be tested here. Uh, but, you know, if you're commuting back and forth, you should always be six feet away. You should always be wearing a mask. It, it's a transient contact, not unlike going to get food someplace. Coach Wells, this question's for you. Are we going to have to practice with masks on? That's a great question. And, and obviously that's, as we just talked about, the safest way for you not to have contact with uh, uh, spit and saliva and different things is to make sure you protect that area. We noticed in football, we just put a release out where on every single football helmet, we built a shield that goes inside of their face mask. So uh, they have a shield protection between them and their opponent. So they will not have to be required even during warmups or anything of that nature to have to wear a mask as long as they have their helmet on. It is not a requirement. Actually, it could be a safety issue if you have trouble breathing, things of that nature. If it's really hard exertion, they also make a mask that comes up from your neck. It's called a gaiter that comes up, and sometimes that's a little easier to handle with athletics. But certainly, again, we're still trying to preach, you know, six feet distance, social distance when we're working out and also when we're doing conditioning. But when you get into competitions, you know, you notice the NBA and uh, different things, even on their sidelines, they're wearing their masks. So there's always a point that we need to keep in mind that wearing that mask and staying apart from each other is the most uh, critical piece we have. And the final question that we had pre-submitted or in the chats is as followed. What happens if a student tests locally and it's positive result and they are asymptomatic and or could be a carrier? Uh, or what if it is that they just have the general cold virus, et cetera? Uh, there are so many factors that contribute to what could be result in a false positive. My husband is a physician and we would, we have been researching at length different factors that could generate a false positive. How are we handling false positives? So we, we can do a retest. That's not a problem. False positives are actually an incredibly rare occurrence. They don't happen very often, but they do occasionally happen. Uh, so if you have somebody who's asymptomatic and they test positive, then I would suggest that you, you quarantine them for at least four or five days. And if they don't have any more symptoms, they'll get tested again and see if it, if it is one of those rare false positives. Uh, I, I think that there is far more harm done if they get a positive test and they don't have symptoms and we turn them loose into the community because they're, they're likely to be shedding virus at a high enough rate that they can infect other people. So it's, it's much safer to take a false positive and quarantine them for a while and get them retested than it is to think that maybe this one's a false positive and turn them loose. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to err on the side of safety and, and we'll keep doing that. Coach Wells, another question came in for you. Yeah. Uh, sport is postponed until the spring. Will practice occur before then, as in fall or winter, or will they begin during the spring? 
Yeah, absolutely. And a, and a good question, too, is just you have to kind of adjust your brain a little bit. If sports and seasons are moved around, this is nothing new to uh, a lot of our sports. You're just going to see some different sports doing their training beforehand and after. So things are going to move around a little bit. But certainly we're not going to stop training and practicing no more than we would stop study halls because we're in the off season. So all of that and, and really what a great opportunity for development for uh, people that need to make that development, which is all of them, for freshmen coming into school, the opportunity to really get a handle on their system and their coaches, great development area for them to, to consider workouts and things of that nature. So we will continue with practice. I think that – I don't think – I know the rule is 24 weeks that you have to work. Uh, the NEI is looking to see if they can stretch that or if all seasons fit into it to make sure. And so it's not a very smart – Playing to practice football five days a week for an entire semester. So we would adjust our coaches, our, our professionals, and we'll make sure we make those uh, right decisions on when practices, what they're going to look like. And some may be strength training, some may be conditioning, some may be actual practice uh, times, but we'll do that within the rules of the NEI. And I also see another question on there, Justin, real quick about we'll, uh, we'll move in date to be adjusted for domestic soccer athletes. Uh, each coach has their list of win, and Brandon, you can jump in on that too to know which each one of them is. Uh, obviously, an international student right now during these times has a little bit more flexibility, and uh, we're going to do that as, as recommended and as, as, as allowed. But each soccer student will have a set time that Coach Warford can uh, set with you to make sure that you know that time to come check in. I'm not sure those dates. I don't have them in front of me, but uh, please contact Coach Warford. Well, the rest of soccer will come in on Friday. You should be getting your times here in the next day or so once the, the coach divides out who they want to come and how many at one time. Um, but all of soccer other than international are Friday, unless, of course, you test positive and have to delay it for your negative testing. And for international students, as long as they tell us when they're ready and we know ahead of time, we're just working with them on their schedule because travel is, is crazy right now. I think we answered all the questions. Are there any other questions that we have? Well, Justin, if there aren't any other questions, let me just close this off by saying thank you to everybody uh, who has come and, and spent an evening with us listening. Um, I hope that we've been able to answer some of your questions and given you some assurance uh, that we at the University of Pikeville are doing everything we can to keep your son or daughter as safe as we possibly can. Uh, these are very odd times and we know that uh, and we never know from one day to the next when the governor or someone will tell us that you know that's it we can't do this anymore. So flexibility has kind of been our key word all through the summer. We've been uh, telling, asking faculty to be flexible, asking students and staff to be flexible and I have to tell you that the team of people that you have on your screen right now have been among the most hardworking, loyal, and dedicated to the success of your students that you will find anywhere. So I want to thank each and every one of these panelists for working in the way that they have, for doing everything possible, and for the many, many long hours and late nights that you have spent, and I know you will spend, to keep these students as safe as we can. So thank you, everyone, and with that, we'll say good night. <laughs>